From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. Up first, Eric takes a look at the condition of winter wheat across Kansas with K-State wheat production specialist Romulo Lolato. Romulo says that early planted winter wheat has been helped by cooler conditions and some timely rainfall. However, growers are seeing some yellowing. He explains why that might be occurring. Also, Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McOwen, discusses farmland leases, something he recently covered on his blog. Also, agricultural news from the Farm Service Agency and this week's Stop, Look, and Listen. It's all just ahead on Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options. Generating solutions. We're glad to have you along with us for this Agriculture Today. And first up, winter wheat in the limelight and the latest observations on the state of the Kansas crop with our guest, as well as some discussion about what might be causing yellowing in wheat stands. Joining us here, Romulo Lolato is with us. Romulo is a wheat production specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Starting off, Romulo, with your general overview of winter wheat in Kansas, how it's looking currently, and this cooler weather was just what winter wheat likes, wasn't it? Hi, Eric. Yes, well, uh, traveling around the state here recently, uh, we see that uh, the, the rainfall that we had during the month the month of March was really helpful to the crop overall, right? We had anywhere from, I guess, the driest part of the state might have gotten 1.5 to 2 inches all the way to over 6 inches. And so that was a extremely beneficial rainfall to the winter wheat crop, which was before then uh, somewhat in a dry condition, right? We had a relatively dry fall and, and winter there, except for southeast Kansas. And so that rainfall, anywhere from two to six or, or more inches, was extremely beneficial. So right now, traveling around the state, overall, the, the crop status seems to be in a good shape, right? The crop seems to be in a good shape, seems to be in a good condition, again, because of these recent rainfalls. We still have those two very different crops, right? The one that got planted early, that one is looking actually really good for most of the state. The one that was planted late, talked to some growers in the northwest corner of the state, uh, they were mentioning that just now they're able to start uh, rowing the crops, right? So the, the crop is just now big enough to start rowing. And those conditions, they are uh, complicated because the crop is kind of late in development, right? In those conditions. And, and just to give a, a brief reminder to the listener in case uh, they have missed our previous pieces here, but that crop actually happened because regardless of when it was planted in that mid to late October time frame, it never really emerged until sometime in uh, mid-November until we had some rainfalls to really get the crop emerged and going. And so the conditions of that, that late emerged crop, we're still about to see. Definitely that rainfall is going to benefit that crop as well, right? It's uh, growing and taking on development, but of course it's uh, considerably later than where it should be. And so uh, what happens there is that the entire phenology of the crop, the important stages of grain yield development, they're all delayed, right? And so grain yield happens later in the year, which is hotter conditions, and that can decrease our yield potential. So again, overall, that early planted crop is actually looking really good shape. Even the the, the, the late planted ones, if it emerged er, er, a little bit earlier as, as well, it's looking good. But the one that emerged later, we're still to see. It has conditions because of the moisture, but it is relatively late in comparison to where it should be. What we want to talk about here for the balance of our time is the possibility of some fields turning yellow here in the spring. This is not all that uncommon, but producers, when they see it happen in their fields, are always asking, naturally, what's going on there? And there are a variety of possible reasons, you say. 
Yes. So as you mentioned, it is normal that during this time of the year, we start seeing some fields kind of turn more yellow than what we would like. And there are several reasons for those, right? A few of these reasons, Eric, they will be nutrient related, right? And so, for example, uh, we might start seeing some nitrogen deficiency or even some sulfur deficiency during this time of the year. And what happens there is that the crop is really taking on growth, right? Really taking on spring development now and really increasing the amount of biomass that it has. Together with that biomass increase, there is a huge increase in the nutrient requirement for that crop. It needs to maintain that biomass. So it's going to, it, it is the actually the, the most active phase in terms of uptake of nutrients, right? And those nutrients mostly being nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur, right? As the macronutrients that the plants need. Now, because of that, and, and at the same time, it's relatively cool now, right? Because it's relatively cool, the organic matter, it's not releasing as much of those nutrients as it will release later in the season. So there might be a mismatch between what the crop needs and what the crop is actually requiring for that growth and what that organic matter is being able to release right now. And so in the case of the, this match being just a timing issue, this uh, yellowing might, go, might, might fade later on, right? As the organic matter starts to release more nitrogen and sulfur, that deficiency might uh, very well kind of like uh, disappear and the crop might yield normally. Now, in cases where that severe is true and, and, and deficient because we have very low organic matter or because there was not a proper fertility to the crop, then that yellowing can cause yield losses. So, and nitrogen and sulfur, they can be pretty similar in symptoms uh, with the difference there that uh, nitrogen is very mobile within the plant. And so uh, we will see that uh, whenever the crop starts going through deficiency, the older leaves are going to translocate the nutrient to the newer leaves because it's mobile. And so we see the yellowing in the lower leaves, in the bottom leaves. Alternatively, if we're talking about sulfur, sulfur is not as mobile within the plant as nitrogen is. And so we start to see the deficiency on the upper leaves. And that yellowing of the upper leaves, it really gives a very different aspect to the field. It really looks more like a, almost like a, a very bright type of deficiency. And so it's easier to recognize just because it's the top leaves that are going to go yellow. So again, in both of these cases, uh, a shot of nitrogen or a shot of nutrient uh, of sulfur might very well take care of, of the deficiency. Or if the soil has enough organic matter here in, in, in 10 days or 15 days, we might not see the deficiency anymore because the organic matter released what the crop was needing. Producers in that situation will have to make a judgment call as to whether or not to supplement the stand with either nitrogen or sulfur then. But it's something worth examining. Could this yellowing also tie back, Romulo, to the adverse cold weather we saw, freeze injury, uh, or the colder weather we've seen of late at the, the wrong time? Could that be a factor here? Yes, that definitely could. And, and we saw these last weeks, actually, several fields that were looking, uh, they were kind of like, turning brown those upper leaves were starting to turn brown and from far away it looks like it's yellowing right and once you get nearby and start seeing what's happening is that those top leaves they are bleaching right essentially that cold spell it really it was so it was not as severe in terms of temperature right that late march early april we have had a few nights there where the lowest temperatures got to to that mid-20s perhaps for most of central kansas but because the crop was already into spring growth and more sensitive to those cold conditions, it was enough to damage some of the leaf tissue, especially for crops that uh, perhaps were under heavy residue, right, no-till residue, and there was accumulation of residue there. And so in those parts of the field, we'll have more yellowing than in neighboring parts. And so cold could definitely have done it. Uh, if that's the case, as long as the crown is, is good and still alive, the crop should grow out of it as well. In, in fact, a couple of weeks back, we saw that the crop really turned yellow because of that cold spell of late March. And going to the same fields this week, it was already back to green. And so we could see that there was no, no damage to the crown, but instead the damage was mostly to the foliage. So one could simply inspect crown damage to get a feel for the possibility of recovery then? Yes, if you split that uh, stem in half uh, and look for that growing point, the developing head, if it's uh, like a dark brown mushy, that's a pretty bad sign that the, probably that tiller is gone. If that, that crown's still nice and, and 
firm and light green, kind of yellow, uh, whitish light green, uh, then it's a pretty good sign that that dealer is still alive and the damage might have been only to the leaves, so the crop should recover well. Or could the yellow cast to the wheat be the work of any number of diseases? And we'll probably talk later with Kelsey Anderson about that in depth, but that's a potential here as well, isn't it, Romulo? Yeah, so during this time of the year, we also start seeing an increase in several types of diseases, right? Uh, Some of them are foliar fungal diseases. For example, if we have some tent spot or some septoria, tritici blotch, or or some of these um, diseases that might survive on the residue and then infect the wheat canopy, Typically, these are the diseases that start happening earlier in the crop cycle. So there's definitely a possibility that those diseases could be causing some of that leaf yellowing. And that's especially true for no-till fields, uh, wheat on wheat, for example, where the residue from the previous wheat crop might have saved some of those uh, fungi pathogens. And it's important to remember that last year we had an unusual year in terms of pressure of 10 spot and septoria, some of these early season leaf spotting diseases. So those leaf spotting diseases, they can be a concern. Are they going to cause significant yield losses? It depends on the weather conditions moving forward and on the genotype susceptibility. So in some susceptible genotypes, these early infections often spot or septoria, they might as well continue infecting the upper canopy. And in that case, we can see significant yield losses from these diseases as well. So we need to keep an eye. You know, uh, in, in some situations, an early fungicide might be a strategy to avoid some of those yield losses. Although that early fungicide in Kansas does not always result in a net yield benefit. So it really depends on the weather conditions. And we will touch base with you once again quite soon. In all likelihood, Romulo, as our wheat crop in Kansas continues to progress toward heading eventually and then harvest. Many thanks to you. Thank you very much, Eric. He is wheat production specialist Romulo Lulato, K-State Research and Extension. He's along with us regularly here on Agriculture Today. When a thunderstorm approaches, follow these safety tips. Lightning, known as the underrated killer, usually strikes the tallest objects. So avoid standing beneath trees or other isolated tall objects. Take shelter in a sturdy building. Remember, if you're close enough to hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. Help keep you and your family safe this severe weather season. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Coming your way now on Agriculture Today, our regular get-together with Professor of Agricultural Law and Taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McGowan. On his blog that he maintains regularly, Roger had an article that's certainly well worth exploring. We'll do so today on the tax considerations of farmland leases. And these can get quite deep, actually, as a matter of fact, Roger. But we'll start with the fact that the type of lease in place is the driver here, is it not? It really is, Eric. And of course, uh, to start out with, and I'll reiterate this probably as we go through this, but uh, we always want to get these leases in writing. Uh, I know kind of talking to a brick wall when I say that (laughs) because a lot of farmers do not put farm leases in writing, but it's always best to do so, not just from a legal standpoint in terms of trying to avoid problems between tenant and the landlord, But also, as we'll see, it makes a big difference if you get questioned on your tax return upon audit by IRS. You know, they're going to want to know what type of lease you had because it's important for a number of reasons tax-wise. But a lot of farmers are really good about understanding the economics behind certain types of lease arrangements, whether it's cash or or whether we're flexing that cash rent or whether it's a hybrid cash or guaranteed bushel or some type of minimum cash or crop share lease or you know, livestock share lease. You know, we're, we're real good at allocating risk between landlord and tenant and negotiating that. And that seems to be pretty well understood. I think what's much less well understood is the importance of that lease on what we can do in terms of tax planning. And that's really, really important because it all fits together here, or it should. The whole package from the economics of the lease to the tax considerations and even into estate and business planning. 
Well, let's tie this together by looking at it by way of the kinds of taxation that can occur and how those various lease types would align with that, starting with self-employment tax. Yeah, and what we look at here, of course, is on the landlord side of things, because on the tenant side, the tenant is the farmer. Mm -hmm. And so the tenant as the farmer is able to take advantage of all of the provisions in the tax code that are written favorably for farmers, because the tenant is the one that is the farmer under the lease. And so what we're concerned about here is on the landlord side, that type of lease makes a difference tax-wise for the landlord. The landlord, if they are a farmer under the lease, then the landlord can take advantage of all those tax-favorable provisions that apply to people that are defined as farmers or those that are engaged in the trader business of farming. If they're just engaged in a rental activity, that's not a farm activity. So you're not a farmer and you can't take advantage of those special provisions that we'll get to in a moment. Mm -hmm. Now, if the lease is a lease that requires, and this is a key to all of this, it requires the landlord to materially participate. In other words, bear the risk of production, bear the risk of price change, or a degree of that under the lease, then the landlord is deemed to be in the trader business of farming. Well, the good side is, as I mentioned, you get to take advantage of these nice tax provisions that Congress has built into the code for farmers. The downside is that your rental income then becomes subject to self-employment tax because you are engaged in the trader business of farming. You're no longer in a a rental activity, the income from which is not subject to self-employment tax, uh, but you're a farmer. A lot of farmers don't like that. I think I may have mentioned this uh, in the past, Eric, but uh, I think that uh, you can tell when you have uh, a child that's born, they're going to grow up to be a farmer because uh, I'm convinced they have two chips that they're born with in their head, uh, one of which is to never pay any self-employment tax. (laughs) And so a lot of farmers, uh, if if they are a landlord under a lease, they want the lease income, but they don't want to generate self-employment tax by being deemed to be engaged in the trader business of farming. Well, what we tell farmers is, okay, we've got to do uh, some math here. What are you giving up by avoiding self-employment tax? And you're going to give up uh, the possibility of of deriving certain types of deductions, certain types of exclusions, uh, and on and on the list might go. So it's not as easy as just saying, well, I want to be in a passive situation. I want to uh, get cash rent so I don't have to pay self-employment tax. It's a little bit, in fact, quite a bit more complex than that. The devil is in the details here as far as what is material participation, Mm -hmm. and that will be defined by the kind of lease in large part? Right. Uh, Cash lease, uh, all you're doing is collecting the cash rent. You're not making decisions. You're not uh, bearing risk of production or risk of price change. That's not subject to self-employment tax. But once we change that, uh, if we start flexing the lease, we might be able to get there. Uh, If we uh, perhaps have a bonus payment that comes in at year end now, and often that's still a, a cash lease situation with a bonus payment based on price or production, and that may satisfy FSA, but it may not satisfy IRS. And so we've got two different considerations on a lot of these situations. And, and what I'm focusing on today was, would be the IRS side of things. Mm-hmm. But basically what it boils down to, if we're sharing expenses, we're sharing crop, we're sharing uh, livestock sale proceeds, once IRS sees that you're bearing risk of production, in other words, your income under the lease depends on how productive the crop has been, uh, what the price is that the tenant receives upon sale, and you get a share of that. Uh, Same thing with respect to uh, livestock leases. If you're bearing risk of production, risk of price change, you're doing something other than just collecting cash rent, you're making some management decisions, you're participating in management decisions, then you are deemed to be engaged in the trader business of farming. And you can, uh, while you will have self-employment tax on that income, then you've got a bunch of other things you can do. You can exclude some USDA cost share payments. You can deduct soil and water conservation expense. You can take a deduction for fertilizer and lime costs. You can elect farm income averaging. And then at death, if you have been operating under a material participation lease for long enough prior to death, your heirs can make an election in your estate to value the farmland in your estate at its use value for ag purposes, for federal estate tax purposes, rather than fair market value. So you get all of those types of benefits tax-wise 
for having a material participation lease. That's the upside of that. When we weave in here something uh, as diverse as farm program benefits, that throws another element into the fray? It does. Uh, And also when we are leasing to uh, a farming entity that we're also a member of, that's another issue that's out there, the self-rental type situation. So if I keep my farmland owned individually, I lease it to an entity in which I participate and I put it under a a cash lease, uh, the IRS can come in and say, well, because you're participating in the entity, that cash rental income is subject to self-employment tax. And they actually won a major case on that in 1995. Now, on that issue, the tax court has really helped us out with a 2017 opinion, and uh, we can work our way around that now. But when it does come to on the farm program benefit side of things, of course, the landlord doesn't get farm program benefits if they're operating under a cash lease because they're not actively engaged in farming. That's the FSA lingo. So they need to have some participation under the lease. And clearly, payment of self-employment tax on the lease income is going to get you there. But if that's a concern, and you know, in recent years, Eric, uh, federal farm program payments have made a, uh, a pretty substantial portion of total farm income. If we look at the uh, uh, Kansas data on that from the farm management system, uh, it does show that farm program payments have made a substantial portion of the total of farm income in, in recent years. And so landlords may want to grab some of those payments. To do so, you've got to be actively engaged. If you're just a straight cash rent landlord, then the payments are going to go to the tenant who's actually doing the farming. If we're sharing it, uh, sharing the crop, sharing the livestock, then we're going to split the payments in accordance with what uh, the breakout is under the lease, so whether it's 60-40 or one-third, two-third. We'll work it that way. But the landlord has to make certain contributions, and you've got land, labor, or capital, and those contributions have to be at risk, and they have to be commensurate with, that's the FSA language, with the landlord's share of the profits and losses from that farming operation. So there's a lot of considerations uh, when you enter into a lease arrangement. Certainly, you want to get it in writing. And I think what people should understand here, and should be clear by now, that if you get challenged on any of these things, you need to show a written document. Here's my written lease that I have. Here's what I'm required to do if you're trying to prove material participation, because IRS can knock you out if you don't have the evidence to show how you structured your lease. If it's just your word and nothing in writing, you're going to be in a worse uh, situation. Uh, You're you're always better off to get that lease in writing. And as you said at the outset, as the tone setter, landlords and tenants both often look at leases for their economic advantages directly with Mm -hmm. these tax consequences maybe in the background, but they shouldn't be. They should be in the forefront, you'd say. Yeah, we should consider the entire package, the economics of it, the tax considerations, and the farm program payment benefits, too. Those all have to be considered when we sit down and try to structure the appropriate lease arrangement uh, for a farmer and their landlord. The details important, and Roger has captured those in this blog write-up entitled, appropriately enough, Tax Considerations When Leasing Farmland. You can find that at washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. Roger, we appreciate the input, and in two weeks we'll talk again. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. He's a professor of agricultural law and taxation, Washburn University School of Law, and a guest every other week here in Agriculture Today. That's Roger McCohen, and we'll return with more in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. With the shortage of primary care positions, especially in rural areas, Health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. In today's agricultural news, Eric has an update on activity taking place at the Farm Service Agency. 
Up for you now on Agriculture Today, our regular installment featuring information from your farm service agency. And we've invited back by from the state FSA headquarters, Josh Ritter. Josh is the farm loan chief for Kansas USDA slash FSA. And last time you were here, Josh, we discussed the ins and outs of what's called the USDA Direct Farm Ownership Program. You have another program, similar name, but a different critter that you wanted to talk with us today about. Yeah, I think today I'd like to discuss uh, FSA's Direct Farm Operating Loan Program. And like the Direct Farm Ownership Program, the funds for our Direct Farm Operating Loan Program are provided directly by the government to the producer. But unlike the Farm Ownership Program, which is used to purchase real estate, our Operating Loan Program is used to finance farm operating expenses. Because that's key to eligibility here, needs more definition. You say it's used to finance farm operating expenses. What do those include specifically? Yeah, sure. Uh, FSA's farm operating loan program can be used for a variety of different purposes. One of the primary purposes is to purchase machinery, equipment, and or livestock that are necessary for the farm operation. The program can also be used to finance annual farm operating expenses, which include feed, seed, fertilizer, pesticides, farm supplies, and cash rent payments. Those funds can also be used for costs associated with reorganizing a farm to improve profitability. An example of this would be to purchase equipment needed to convert from conventional to no-till production or something similar to that. And also the program can be used to refinance non-real estate farm-related debts. So in short, there are several different ways that producers can take advantage of FSA's operating loan program to help expand their operations and improve profitability. There's a fair amount of latitude within this program. Some of the particulars on loan provisions and stipulations, what about those? Yeah, the maximum loan amount available under this direct farm operating loan program is $400,000, and that's a cumulative total. If a producer has an outstanding $200,000 operating loan, they could apply for another direct operating loan for up to an additional $200,000. The repayment terms vary based on what the loan purpose is but cannot exceed seven years. Annual operating loans are generally generally repaid within 12 months or when the commodities produced are sold. Right now, the interest rate for the program is currently 1.5%. The interest rate is adjusted monthly, but once the loan is closed, the interest rate is fixed for the life of the loan. Those are the terms that producers would want to know about. Eligibility requirements for these. Producers have to meet certain requirements to uh, gain an FSA farm operating loan? That's correct. And there are several eligibility criteria that producers will need to work through with their local FLP office. But a couple of general thoughts to keep in mind are, if the producer can obtain sufficient credit elsewhere at reasonable rates and terms, then the producer will not be eligible for a direct loan through FSA because we don't compete with commercial lenders. Also, direct operating loans require applicants to have sufficient education, training, or at least one year's experience in managing or operating a farm or a ranch within the last five years. To meet this requirement through education, the applicant needs to have completed an educational program in agriculture. This would include either a two- or four-year degree from a college in ag business, horticulture, animal science, agronomy, or other ag-related field. To meet the requirement through farm experience, the applicant has to have been an owner, manager, or operator of a farm business for at least one entire production cycle. This is generally shown through either production records and or income and expense records like a Schedule F from a tax return. Of course, producers will be walking through all of those particulars with the local FSA loan chief so they can help them through that process as far as what is required in fulfilling all the paperwork and such. Correct. You say, though, Josh, there is an FSA youth loan program that falls under the heading of the direct farm operating loan program. What about that? Yeah, our FSA youth loan program is available to kids or young adults between the ages of 10 and 20. The maximum loan amount for the program is $5,000, and the interest rate is currently 1.5%, just like the other operating loan program. The Youth Loan Project must provide an opportunity for the young person to acquire experience in education and agriculture-related skills, and the project must be sponsored by an advisor such as a 4-H club, FFA, tribal youth organization, or similar agriculture-affiliated group. The program offers a great avenue for kids or young adults to become familiar with the loan-making process and get experience with financial management with the help of an advisor. A lot of the time the program is used to fund a fair project and gives the opportunity for some kids to buy a steer or heifer or pig or something of that nature that otherwise wouldn't be able to do so. It's just a really fun program for everybody involved and helps get 
helps get kids kind of acclimated to what a loan is and, and give them some responsibility with some guidance. So if they're eyeing that project for the county fair coming up this summer or otherwise, this would be a great way to finance that, the FSA Youth Loan Programs. Check that out at the FSA local headquarters as well. Speaking of which, any updates on local operations, Josh? Yeah, as many of our listeners are aware, FSA offices around the country are still in limited staffing situations due to COVID-19. While we still don't have all of our employees back in the office, I do have some exciting information to share, I think. Starting this week, our offices can start allowing customers back in the office by appointment only. I mean, while I think our agency has done a very good job serving our customers given the circumstance we've been dealing with, it is exciting that we can start meeting with customers face-to-face again. So if you're listening and would like the opportunity to meet with somebody in your local FSA office in person to go over like an application or or something of that nature, please give that office a call and set up an appointment and see if they're open. Long time coming, and it's great news that the person-to-person meetings will be facilitated now. Yeah, I I agree, and hopefully more good news to come on that front. Excellent. We'll, We'll be listening for that. In the meantime, those are some of the Finer points of the Direct Farm Ownership Program through the USDA and Farm Service Agency. Those good folk there at those local offices can fill you in further on how those loans can be obtained and how they can be taken advantage of by you producers. Josh, always a pleasure. Thanks for coming over. Thank you. I appreciate the time. He is Josh Ritter, Farm Loan Chief with the USDA and the Farm Service Agency here in Kansas. Thanks, Eric. And this reminder to listen to the podcast version of Agriculture Today, visit agtoday.net, agtoday.net, or using an app on your mobile device, type these search keywords, Agriculture Today Kansas, and you'll find this program. By tapping the subscribe button, brand new episodes of Agriculture Today will automatically arrive on your device. That's agtoday.net. And that's a look at today's agricultural news. Agriculture Today continues in a moment with Stop, Look, and Listen. This is the K-State Radio Network. Burning prairie grass is essential for Flint Hills ranchers. Following grazing and burning best practices can ensure that the prairie remains intact while not smoking out downwind neighbors. The Kansas Flint Hills Smoke Management Plan helps guide prescribed burning on prairie land. To learn more, visit www.ksfire.org. Again, that's www.ksfire.org. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. I've noticed the difference or by slight difference in colors among the trees. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. This weekend, if you did not look or see the red bird in bloom, you missed the show. Here on my hill, they are blooming full blast, and the weather was perfect. Years ago, and I still do in the fall when the seed pots hang on the tree, I collect seed. I strip the seeds off and take the bucket and just throw the seed out along the edge of the woods. Here on the hill, I see the results in the small red bud seedlings coming up along the woodland edge. The blooming of the red bud is a one-shot deal, and it was this weekend. Of course, it depends on where you are, more up north, It could be slightly delayed due to the colder nights. I've always liked the tree which is purple or rose purple blossoms. I have noticed a difference, albeit a slight difference, in colors among the trees. Here around the house I pointed out a darker and deeper colored tree standing by itself to a friend. It's still a small tree growing on the prairie behind the house. I just could not mow it off when mowing the grass one time before May 5th. I've watched a small tree grow over the years. It's now a good seven feet tall. It's one of many. The others are growing along the tree line. The tree is a very successful landscape plant. 
The nursery industry has collected seed as well as the plant breeders, and when a deeper purple or a softer pink is found, they feel they've hit the jackpot, hoping that this is the one homeowners and park superintendents want to add to the landscape. The color difference may be slight, but just enough to get excited about. I noticed Durr in his book, Manual of Landscape Plants, lists at least 25 cultivars. The differences are in color, but also in tree size and tree shape. A few, such as forest pansy, are very popular in the trade. I like to name Appalachian Red, simply because that is where I first saw the small tree growing in its natural habitat, in abundance, beautiful. The leaves are an attractive hard shape with yellowish color in the fall. There is a Chinese redbud, as there is a European redbud. The European redbud is also called the Judas tree because of the legend. Of course, if you choose a redbud for your landscape, a very good choice for a small tree, you can plant it in spring or fall. It prefers slightly moist, deep soil. It does not like wet soils. It will grow in full sun or slight shade. Remember, it is an understory tree. Tree stress, like lack of water, too much water, as well as mechanical injury, think about beating it with a weed trimmer, make it a short-lived or a suffering tree. A weakened tree is more susceptible to cancer. Once planted in the right place, treat the tree with respect and it will bloom for years. When I bought trees to plant on the farm, I ordered some red buds. Those were small trees, all seedlings. They were small trees typical what one gets through the forestry program. They're good trees, but small. It's not what one buys from the nursery. But when I now walk the fields on the farm where I planted along the edges and the creek, the purple haze is all around. The trees have grown and blend in naturally. It's a show, and I love it. The name Judas tree is the story of Judas having hanged himself on a branch of the redbud, supposedly having been once a much larger tree. Being now a smaller tree, it can never again be used for that purpose. A similar story for the white dogwood, another spring flowering tree. The dogwood is beautiful with its white bloom. It's an Appalachian tree. It grows small ever since it would supposedly was used for the crucifixion of Christ. These legends started long ago and are legends. George Washington, the president, used to have redbirds dug up and transplanted on his Mount Vernon property. I read the blossoms have been used in salads and that in Mexico, blossoms are fried and eaten as a delicacy. It is thought that redbirds were transported to England around 1696. Of course, the then nursery industry in England took hold of it as it did with many trees coming from the New World, either as small specimens or as seeds. Nurserymen, being nurserymen, then started to experiment and try to outdo each other and claim the market with their results. I've never found the white redbud a tree I needed. Yes, there is a white redbud called Alba in the trade. Here is where the plant breeders get excited. There is royal white. It is a selection which seems to be called hardy. There is dwarf white. It grows 10 to 15 feet tall. As I say this, I'm thinking of a recommendation I made a little while back to plant a redbud in a corner location of a house. Having done so, I can now see that the white bloom against the dark wood exterior of the house might have been a stronger statement in the landscape situation. 
but I just cannot recommend a white redbud. I'll stick with the hardy redbud with plenty of tulips and daffodils underneath. That's what I see in my mind. I stick with my recommendation. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. This reminder to listen to the podcast version of Agriculture Today, visit agtoday.net, agtoday.net. By tapping the subscribe button, brand new episodes of Agriculture Today will automatically arrive on your device. That's agtoday.net. This is the K-State Radio Network.